Well, I'm so grateful to be with you today on this Tuesday evening. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your blessings, for this opportunity to open up your Holy Scripture to us on this day of Bible study. We pray that you bless us with the book of Hebrews and open it up to us, what you want to speak to us. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been looking at the book of Hebrews over the course of the last few weeks, and whether you have been or have not been a part of these classes, I want to make sure we kind of catch you up. I do have a handout that kind of helps you follow through the book of Hebrews, the direction that the author is trying to take us in. And the very first section happens to be with who Jesus is. So the author is writing to Jews who are questioning who this Jesus Christ is. Is he truly the Messiah or is there another? And so the very first part, at least in my outline of it, it talks about who Jesus is. Jesus is. So he spends the first five or six chapters or so, first five chapters, talking about who Jesus is and what his characteristics are. He is, Jesus is God's ultimate revelation. Jesus is God's son, our brother. Okay, and then he goes on. He says, he is the word of faith. And then uh, the last section that we looked at, he is the source of salvation. Okay, so these four things are kind of the beginning salvo that he sets. He wants to make sure that they understand there's something unique about this Jesus there is nobody else like him. And so he uses this priestly language. Again, the understanding that the priests would go in and make sacrifice on behalf of uh, the nation of Israel. But understanding that that priest was also a faulty person who fell short and needed to sacrifice for his own sin as well as the sin of the nation of Israel. And it was only a, a stopgap, a temporary thing. The world has always been waiting and yearning for something that would ultimately reconcile us to relationship with God, and that person is Jesus. So this is what he wants to make sure the Jews understand it. Now, the, you have to understand, the Jews are also going through a time of persecution. Uh, we often think of the early Christian church going through times of persecution, and the church did. The greatest persecution that the Christians uh, found was not necessarily Rome. It wasn't Nero, and it wasn't the Roman emperors. The greatest persecution that they faced was from other Jews. See, the Jews were already a marginalized people in Rome, and so oftentimes a lot of that frustration was taken out upon Christians because they were even a smaller minority group. And so you can imagine if you're a Jew who became a Christian, the type of persecution and anger that you would face from your family for betraying your faith and turning your back on things. But the author of Hebrews would say, you're not turning your back on your faith. You're still a Jew. You're just seeing that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plans for us as a Jewish people. So that is the first section of Hebrews. We get into this next section. So the first section is all about who Jesus is. The second section, if you're following along in my handout, is that Jesus followers, or Jesus calls followers to do, and then, or to be, or to whatever. Jesus, it's what he calls his followers to do. Um, we didn't get to the first part. The very first thing that Jesus calls his followers is to maturity. Now, unfortunately, that section of the Bible lessons are not a part of our lectionary readings. But that's chapter 5 uh, to chapter 6, talking about the maturity of a person who is a, has a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we are called to be mature in our faith. You know, not to be blown uh, back and forth by the winds of this world and what's going on and persecution and all these types of things. Because after all, if Jesus is who the author claims that Jesus is, we need to be mature in our faith. Understand, hey, persecution is going to happen. These things are going to take place. So he also calls us 
two, and this is where we pick up in today's lesson, faithfulness. And this would be chapter seven. And this is what we're looking at today. We're looking at a portion of chapter seven. So keep that in mind as we read a portion of our lesson for today. Although it might, when I read it, it might not sound like that's what we're talking about. But you have to keep this Bible or this pa these passages in context, in their greater context. So he's talking about what Jesus is calling his followers to do, to maturity, to faithfulness. The problem is, is that you can be a really faithful person, but at some point you start to wonder a question. Is the thing that I'm being faithful to worthy of this faithfulness? If you do not, at some point in your life, have those doubts as a Christian, I am being frank with you, I have concerns about you. Let me say that again. Maybe in a different way. Christians doubt and wrestle and get concerned whether or not this Jesus is worthwhile. Because we do go through some difficult times. We lose loved ones. Is there really a God? You know, we go through times of persecution. We lose our jobs. Why would God allow these things happen to me? These very human responses to the, the difficulties of life. And then obviously direct persecution. Family more members are friends who maybe think that you're crazy for believing in this Jesus. Every Christian at some point goes through that, that, that existential crisis, I guess you would say, where you wonder, has this life that I've lived for Jesus Christ been worthwhile? I would be concerned if you don't. That doesn't make you a bad person, and it doesn't make you a sinner, okay? Doubt is not a sign of sin. It's a normal part of the human experience. So he, the author is calling us to be faithful, but with the understanding that there are times that you're concerned. Have I been good enough? Have I done enough? Am I, is this Jesus worthwhile? And that's kind of where we pop into our lesson today. So with that in mind, he's trying to give us comfort so yes, be faithful. I understand you're going to doubt, but here's the person in whom you're putting your trust in. So that's the context of the lesson for today. Be faithful, but let me tell you the quality of the person in whom you are putting your trust to know that it is a worthwhile person in whom you can place this trust. So let's read this. Verse 23. So there have been many of those priests since many of them continued, uh, for, since death prevented uh, them from continuing in office. Now, I, I know, this, we're really just dropped in the midst of this lesson for today. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with this context. Okay? So, trust me. Well, don't trust me. Go and read it. Don't ever trust what I say. Go and prove it, okay? So, read the context surrounding this lesson. And understand, he's talking about your faithfulness. But... These Jewish Christians are doubting whether or not we should go back to, you know, the ritual in uh, Jerusalem and the priests there and so forth and their rituals. And he's saying, wait a minute, be faithful to this Jesus because he's got something that they don't. Hold fast to this course because those priests, he's saying, they die. There's no way that they're one and done and it's done for all eternity. But what this Jesus does, he doesn't die. So what he does, the work that he does, is done for all eternity. This is his argument. So there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But Jesus, because he lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. So be faithful because the person in whom you're putting your trust has a permanence to him. Okay, has a permanence to him. That's an E, believe it or not. There you go. So Jesus has a permanence to him. He is forever, unlike every other priest. You might get attached to a priest, but they come and they go and they live and they die. 
this priest is here forever. So be faithful, because the one in whom you place your trust is permanent. He goes on, therefore, he is able to save completely. He saves completely. So he's permanent. He saves completely. Remember the argument, if you've read through the book of Hebrews up to this point, the, the, the priests before, the ones, the human priests, who come and bring sacrifice every day and every year on the Day of Atonement, they come, they go. Their sacrifice is not permanent. It's, it, it's just a, it's, it's a temporary solution to a permanent problem. We are broken in our relationship with God. Somebody needs to fix us once and for all permanently. This one, this Jesus, does it permanently. Therefore, be faithful to this one. Don't go back to your old ways. Be faithful. Because what he's done, his salvation is forever. So he's done it completely. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him. Remember one of the arguments that we had uh, the other week is that Jesus is the only way, okay? Jesus is the only way to salvation. There aren't many roads to God. There's one road, and it all goes through Jesus Christ, okay? So you can't, now that we have revealed the way, you can't go back to the old way. Because the old way isn't going to get you there. Only Jesus is. So stay faithful. Remember, that's, that's the overarching reason why he's arguing in this way. Stay faithful, because the one you're putting your trust in is permanent. He saves completely. You can't go back to the old way. Because the old way didn't do anything for you. This way is permanent. So as he said, therefore he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Oh, I love this, this thought. He saves completely. He's always there for us. You know, you, <laughs> I actually had somebody uh, pounding on my door the other day at 5 a.m. Uh, before church. I got up and I'm blearily looking out the door. I'm not exactly dressed to go and answer the door. And this is Sunday before church. And I couldn't see anybody out there. They obviously, whoever it was, whatever their emergency was, it wasn't enough to let them stay for very long. They kind of took off and left. But it got me up a little bit earlier than I'd hoped to. Uh, but I can't always be there. So obviously, whoever this person was, I disappointed them. I wasn't there opening the door for them and immediately taking care of whatever their crisis was and their problem was. Unlike me, Jesus is always there for us. When you bang on the door of Jesus, Jesus is always answering and ready. And there for you and ready to intercede for you. Such a high, verse 26, such a high priest truly meets our need. Not our wants. So if you want a house, you want uh, a Maserati or, I don't know, a, B a BMW or something. Whatever it is you want, a million dollars. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Those are wants. You have Jesus. You have enough. You may not even have sufficient food for today. You have Jesus. You have enough. He meets our need He's talking again about a relationship with God. We have everything that we need to have reconciled relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike any other high priest, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins first. And then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. <laughs> well, spectacular. Okay, so this high priest meets our needs. Oops. Saves completely, meets our need. Again, nothing materialistic about the need that he uh, writes here today. So if you're thinking your need being housing, food, uh, healing, uh, and your body, 
whatever these things may be. Those aren't needs. We're all going to die at some point, okay? What we need is a reconciled relationship with God. And Jesus meets everything on that checklist that's needed for us to have a relationship with God. Because ultimately, what does he do? He sacrificed himself. Oops. His, him, self. He gave himself. That's what her need was. See, every other priest, you know, it's like that old uh, uh, um, story about the pig and the, and the chicken, which I've mentioned here before. You know, when, when you're doing a breakfast, the, the, the chicken, well, the chicken is, makes a contribution. The pig is committed to your breakfast, right? <laughs> Gives himself completely over. The chicken, well, it comes back the next day. Well, that's the same thing with the priest. A priest is like a chicken. He gives an egg. Jesus is like the pig. He gives himself. Okay? Gives it all for us. Sacrifices everything. This is something no other priest would do. No other priest was asked to do that. No, it, it wouldn't have been any value anyway. Would not have been any value. My death, your death, can't save anybody. Jesus' death is a gift to the world. Wow. Verse 28, For the law appoints as a high priest men in all of their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son. The oath, the covenant. Okay, it's a new covenant that we're talking about. The oath, the covenant, appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. That's kind of an odd structure at the very end of that. He's been made perfect for. So it means he was imperfect before? No, it just means that the work. Perfect really means um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like bringing something far away near, okay? It's like um, it's a journey. Jesus in his journey completed the journey, okay, of what needed to be done for our salvation. Perfected that. It's not that he was imperfect before and got better as he practiced or, or something like that. If you, like you do if you start working on, uh, I don't know, working on your, your basketball shot or something like that. And you, the first time you can't even hit the rim and you keep working and working and working until you hit it. That's not what he means by uh, Jesus being made perfect, okay, or be, uh, uh, perfect forever. It means taking this, this daunting task and all of these steps that need to be put together to make it happen, which is, again, reconciled relationship with God. And he brought that process together. Okay? That's what it's referring to. And why did Jesus do this? For you. And this is the reason why you can stay faithful to this Jesus. Because he's got your best interests in mind. He is a permanent solution that saves us completely, meets all of our need so that we might have a relationship with God. So don't give up, even if life might seem to be dire at times. Always be faithful, because this one has been faithful to you. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessings of Jesus Christ, though. The one and done high priest who did it once and for all for us. And so the author of Hebrews implores us to be faithful. Faithfulness isn't going to get us the kingdom of heaven. But be faithful because our Lord Christ has been faithful to us. We know that we can depend upon Jesus. We're not going to find that dependability anywhere else. We could go back and seek other ways. And, you know, that, that's great. Maybe sometimes we need to explore just because we need, to, we need to realize how good a thing Jesus is. But ultimately, all roads lead to Jesus. And Jesus is the one that leads us home. Well, I shouldn't say all roads lead to Jesus. Not exactly true. But hopefully our road will ultimately lead us to Jesus. Because any road that does lead ultimately to Jesus is a road that leads us ultimately to the kingdom of heaven. Because... You are the way, the truth, and life, and we give thanks for that. 
comfort that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. For it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. I want to invite God's blessing to be upon you this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.